Hello, and thank you for joining me for this Art in the Time of COVID dance event, uh, which is presented by Arts NL, the Provincial Arts Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. This evening, I'll be giving a lecture demonstration called Where the Words Come From, How Belly Dance, Movement got their, How Belly Dance Movements Got Their Names. Now, the talk tonight is geared towards dancers who practice Middle Eastern, Southwest Asian, or North African styles, um, people who are belly dancers in a variety of different styles, dancers who do other forms of dance who are interested in how the names that we use to express the movements we do affect the way we think about our dance forms. And it may also be of interest to people who study words, but not necessarily dance in particular. So people like lexicologists or sociolinguists. So if you fit into any of those categories or any more that I might not have thought of, this dance uh, talk this evening may be of interest. As a summary of what I'll be covering tonight, First, I'll just give a little overview of what I mean when I use the words belly dance, in case you're not a practitioner of that particular form. Then I'll talk about who invented the words that we now use to talk about the movements of belly dance in English today. Then I'll discuss the relevance of looking at dance movement names. So what can we learn by doing that? And why is that an important area of study? Then I'll give a little overview of the general categories of belly dance movement names, what categories they fall into. And finally, I'll give histories of some particular movement names so that we can look at the different ways that uh, movements were labeled in the past. At the end of this talk, there'll be time for questions. If you're watching this live, you'll see that there's a live chat option on YouTube. So if a question pops into your head at any time while I'm speaking, please go ahead and write it into the live chat. And then once we reach the end of the talk, I'll be able to come back to those questions and answer them. I encourage you to write them down when they come to you so that you don't forget them later. Now, let me just introduce myself. My name is Ainsley Hawthorne. I am a Middle Eastern dancer, a cultural historian, and an author based in St. John's, Newfoundland. As a Mi'kmaq descendant, I'd also like to acknowledge this island as Dahungug, which is Mi'kmaq and Beothic territory. If you're not familiar with land acknowledgements, it's a way to recognize that Canada is colonized territory and sort of a first step in decolonization. A little background on my um, dance practice and research is that I began studying Egyptian dance about 20 years ago uh, as an undergraduate and college student. I became really enamored of Oriental dance, which is one kind of substyle of Egyptian dance. I went on to complete, after my undergraduate degree, I went to Yale University to do a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. So on the academic side of my life, I was looking at the ancient world and particularly focusing on the language, literature, and religion of ancient Mesopotamia, which is the area of modern day Iraq from about 3500 BCE to about 300 BCE. At the same time, while I was doing that graduate work, living in Connecticut, I started to pursue my dance training more seriously. I really threw myself into it. I had a local mentor who was a wonderful dancer named Jean Lowe Carlson. She's an author now as well. And later Morocco of New York and Rocky became a wonderful mentor to me, both uh, in dance performance and in dance research. I also had the opportunity while I was there to study with uh, Egyptian and Middle Eastern style dancers from many parts of the world, including Mahmoud Reda, Rania Rene, um, Artemis Morat, Dahlia Carella, Aisha, and many others. During that time, I was also a choreographer and a performer with the Yale Belly Dance Society, and eventually I taught um, Middle Eastern dance through Yale University Sports and Recreation Program. Now, Dance studies only came into my life after I finished my PhD, after I left Connecticut. So as I say, my, my PhD research was in the ancient world, but with this focus primarily on language and literature. As a dancer, I had many questions about the language that we use to talk about dance. And at some point in recent years, I thought to myself, I could use the linguistic strategies that I used to do my other research um, on the types of questions I have about the language we use around Middle Eastern movement, about historical questions like where the name belly dance itself 
comes from. That's something I looked into that was really interesting to me. So I applied some of the techniques I was using for the ancient world, like corpus, um, corpus based lexical analysis, which is basically you collect all sorts of instances of the ways certain words are used. And by looking at that huge number of different instances, you look for patterns that can help you better understand the meanings of those words. We can also do that for words that are being used and spoken about today. Um, one of the projects that I did in recent years was to do a survey of practicing Middle Eastern dancers in Canada, practicing Middle Eastern dancers and ballet dancers of all levels, so teachers and performers, but also students. And I asked them, what movement names have you heard before? And what movement names do you use in your own teaching if you're a teacher? I had 154 responses to that survey, which I was really pleased with. And then with this data set, I was able to start to get a sense of the words that people are familiar with, that they've heard through our sort of oral tradition in the dance community, and also the decisions they're making uh, if they eventually teach dance as to which words they will pass on to their students, which was a very interesting question for me as well. So I was using some of the um, lexical uh, linguistic analysis techniques that I'd used in some other research to look at what we do in the dance community and try to apply um, those research strategies to these questions. Because dance studies is I would say still an emerging scholarly field. It's been around for several decades, but um, it's, it's still building respectability in academia. Very many universities have music schools, for instance, but very few have dance schools or dance programs because I think dance um, is still considered, uh, how would I say this? It's, it's very much of the body. It's corporeal, it's carnal. And I think for that reason, it can take a while to become respected as something you can look at in a cerebral way as well, because of certain biases we have within our culture about separating the corporeal from the cerebral. I think that's one of the reasons that it's taken a while to start applying academic and scholarly theories to questions that we have in dance, even though many dance practitioners like myself and other people that I interact with are very interested in having these questions researched so that they can um, use some of that information to inform their own dance practice. Um, and so at the moment, I think dance forms in general, but especially non-Western classical forms are under-researched and under-theorized. There aren't a whole lot of people spending um, time on them. So this was one of the reasons that I wanted to, uh, in my spare time, throw, uh, throw myself into a little bit of dance studies research to answer some of these questions that many of us are curious about for the field of belly dance. So let me define what I mean when I say belly dance. It is a family of dance styles that are grouped together under this English language umbrella term. Generally speaking, these are dances that are solo, performed by a single dancer, that are improvised, so not choreographed, but um, done in the moment to the music, and torso articulated. What I mean by torso articulated is that instead of being focused primarily on steps, footwork, or extensions of the body, they're focused on little intricate movements of the shoulders, the chest, and the hips. All of these dances, in order to be considered belly dance, have to have their origins in the Middle East, um, Southwest Asia, or North Africa, although many of the styles that are practiced today have also evolved outside of that region, so in North America, Europe, other parts of the world. Now, some styles of belly dance um, might drop one of the criteria that we associate with the style, so you will see troops of belly dancers, so it's no longer solo in some cases. You will see choreographies very frequently now, um, so not improvised, but um, we group things together based on family resemblance instead of needing to meet every single criteria. Often what we do in our language 
as everyday language users is we kind of group things together based on tradition. They grew out of the same source. And that for that reason, we call all the dances in the family tree belly dance, even if some begin to look less like the roots of the tree. And uh, the second issue is that we group them together because they continue to have certain family resemblances like the torso articulation, even though they might lose other things that were part of the original definition, like the solo performance. So this is the broad category of dances that it are referred to under the name belly dance. And as I mentioned earlier in this talk, I did do some research into where the name belly dance comes from because it's not something that was historically used in Middle Eastern languages for torso articulated solo dance forms. Um, and I became quite curious, well, when did this enter our language? And I've traced it back um, as far as I can. I believe it was introduced into the French language as danse du ventre, so that's a direct translation, belly dance. Um, in uh, when a painting by the artist Jean-Léon Jérôme called uh, The Dance of the Alma was displayed at the 1864 Salon in Paris. And this painting displayed a woman who was dancing in a sort of fantasy Middle Eastern setting. Um, and her abdomen is nude and is sort of pointing out towards the audience. So she is wearing um, clothing, but her abdomen in particular is really very prominent in the painting. It appears that what occurred is uh, the media started derisively referring to the painting, which was named Dance of the Alma as the belly dance, La Danse du Ventre, because it had this sort of prominent abdomen, which would have been considered really scandalous um, to see a woman's abdomen portrayed in that way in Paris in 1864. So that appears to be where the name first entered um, our lexicon and it spread out from there into other languages um, by 1889, which was the time of the Paris World's Fair that gained this sort of international publicity. And there were Middle Eastern dancers there, belly dancers, who were absolutely widely talked about sensational and the news appeared in newspapers all over the world. So that's when we start to see the name filtering out. If you'd like to read more about that, because it's not really the subject of this talk, I do have a paper on it out there. Um, and so you can contact me for more, um, for more information on that. But the paper is called Middle Eastern Dance and what we call it, uh, where I sort of write up that history. But I just wanted to give you an introduction to the dance forms we're talking about in case you're not familiar with them. So within the forms that we call belly dance, how did people start naming movements? When did that process begin? And who came up with the movement names that we are still using today that have become a part of our oral tradition and that are passed from one dancer to the next now? What's interesting is this does not seem to be something that was inherited from the Middle Eastern North African roots of the dance, but rather something that began when the dance was imported into Western contexts, so European and North American contexts. North Americans began learning Middle Eastern dance in substantial numbers during the Arab nightclub boom of the 1950s and 1960s. At that time, there was a huge explosion in um, nightclubs that were Arab run that featured Arab music in both Canada and the United States, but they encountered a problem. So their patrons wanted entertainment. They wanted to see dancers, but there were not enough people from the cultures of origin wanting to perform the dances publicly for them to be able to fill their stages every night that they wanted to have performers available. So what wound up happening was these clubs hired locals, mostly women, with often no particular connection to Middle Eastern and North African cultures, to come into the clubs as dancers. And many of those people, they just learned on the job. So there was nowhere that they could go to take a belly dance class. That didn't exist. So they were hired by these clubs because perhaps they were already dancing another style uh, and were already capable dancers. And when they went to the club, they would watch what the people from Egypt were doing, 
what the people from Lebanon were doing, both on stage performers and off stage in social dance. And they would gradually learn and pick up those movements so they could incorporate them into their performances in the nightclubs. So it was very much an informal um, process of observing other people and learning as they went. It was not like a structured, um, structured training process or apprenticeship or anything like that by and large, very informal. In the 1960s, we experienced in North America a rise in a, this new fitness culture. So this idea that people should go, go somewhere specific like a fitness center that's dedicated to exercise and um, weightlifting training in order to do their physical conditioning. All sorts of fitness centers opened across North America and women's fitness in particular became something of a craze. So whereas maybe women weren't seen as, maybe it wasn't seen as appropriate for women to do a whole lot of sweaty, active physical activity prior to the 1960s. In the 1960s, there's a bit of a culture change and now actually it becomes trendy and fashionable for women to you know, get into fitness gear, go out to a fitness center and work out. In response, you have um, classes opening up, fitness classes of different kinds that are targeted to this new female audience, this new market of people who are interested in physical fitness and are exploring their options for keeping in shape. Um, at that time, belly dancers began teaching classes, which were mainly targeted at this new group of women uh, who were looking for physical activities. Some of the dancers who started teaching were from the cultures of origin. And when I say that, I mean Middle Eastern and North African cultures where belly dance and related styles originate. But many were uh, North American dancers, the same dancers who'd been hired by the nightclubs and had learned that way, now started uh, teaching other North American women to dance. These are the dancers who coined names for various movements to use in their teaching. In the 1970s, so beginning in 1972 or so, some of these dance teachers begin publishing how-to books. So this was another sort of craze fitness how-to books and uh, lots of belly dance teachers got in on it by publishing their own books. And in those books, they begin to disseminate the terms that they had been using in their classes for small groups of people to a much wider audience. Once these books are published, many of them gain national and international readerships. So suddenly words that were confined to a small local area um, start spreading around nationally and internationally. Those names are some of the ones that we still use today. Some caught on, others didn't. It was a completely haphazard process, no standardization of any kind. Individual teachers might have had a sort of particular standardized naming format that they used, but that was not consistent across all the many teachers who were working in different places. So they published their how-to books, the names are all completely different. I've actually collected movement names from 23 belly dance how-to books that were published between 1972 and 2016, so broad breadth of time. In those 23 books, there are 1,000 distinct movement names. So you can see from that, there isn't a lot of consistency. There is uh, some repetition. Certain names are used in several different books. Certain names catch on. But there are also a lot of unique coinages where people appear to be inventing their own names, putting their own names out there, and everyone is doing their own thing. As a result, many movements have several different names attached to them. So anyone who does belly dance will know this. Um, most of us know multiple names for the same movement. And on the other hand, sometimes there's a name that can potentially describe several different movements or perhaps like several different variations of a similar movement and this type of thing. But you can't really rely on a name alone to tell you what someone, the movement that someone expects you to do because of this lack of terminological standardization in the history of our dance form. Still to this day, there is no standardization. Um, I have found in my survey 
that I did of Canadian dancers that individual dance teachers tend to choose the names that they pass on to their students that they use in class based on several different criteria. One of them is tradition, what they learned from their own teachers. One is clarity, so how um, accurately does the name capture the movement that they want their student to do? And the third is recognizability, which is an interesting one because that's based on what teachers predict their students might have heard elsewhere or might in the future hear elsewhere. So they want their students to be able to understand um, names that they hear on YouTube videos or names that they hear from visiting instructors. So still today, teachers are kind of making these um, decisions in their own pedagogical context about which names to use based on a variety of different factors. Now, why were Western dancers the ones to name Middle Eastern dance movements, or at least dancers who were working in the West, because some of them were from the cultures of origin? Um, it seems to trace back to the differences between the way these dancers are learned in their home countries versus the way they're learned in Europe and North America. So in the home countries of the dance, people learn through participatory transmission. What I mean by that is children learn dance by doing it. So belly dance, torso articulated dance, um, describes social styles of dance that are done by everyday people of all ages, as well as performance styles that are intended for the stage. So a, a young child who is in a country like Egypt, for example, when they go to a social occasion or celebratory event like a wedding, they'll observe adults dancing and imitate those adults. Some of the adults might be informal, casual social dancers. They might also see professional dancers who are often hired for celebrations. And they learn movements by doing them in those contexts, by mirroring the people they see around them. It's a type of holistic learning. Dance movements are learned in context with music. So at the same time as children are picking up the physical movements of their bodies, they're also learning musicality. They're learning the way that the movements can match with the music that they're hearing. Musicality is very important in most belly dance styles. And this is something that um, someone learning in a participatory context has a chance to start to pick up from the very, very beginning. Dance movements are also learned in context with the venue. So children learn uh, the cultural codes defining appropriate times, places, and circumstances for this type of dance. They're also learned in context with other dance movements. So the, they're not broken down into what we might call individual moves. They're learned in sequence. They flow one into each other. They're not broken down into little components and then built back up into the dance. The whole thing is learned as a uh, movement language, as a movement vernacular um, from the very beginning. Always, movements are always in series. They're always embedded. Uh, Barbara Sellers Young, who's a belly dance scholar, refers to this method of informal dance transmission as culturally somatic, by which she means it engages all of the body's senses in the learning process, which I think is a very helpful way to think about it. And that's based on Thomas Hanna's concept of somatic education. So learning with the whole body, not just learning with your eyes, for example. In North America and Europe, on the other hand, um, we have a very strong tradition of studio dance instruction. Uh, this is the way that most Western classical styles like ballet are taught to young students in a dance classroom with mirrors and a teacher at the front of the room. There's sort of a hierarchical structure. When Middle Eastern and North African dances were imported to North America, um, few people were exposed to these dances as children because most people uh, in North America do not have connections to um, the Middle East or North Africa. And Canada percentage is, I think, 3.5% who have Middle Eastern or, or um, West Asian descent. Um, so most people who could potentially be learning belly dance and related styles in North America are cultural outsiders. 
most of them also start learning as adults. They don't start learning as children. So most dance education here occurs in dance studios following this Western classical pedagogy. Dance here is parsed into discrete movements that are taught individually, usually um, without music, slowly to start with. Then you add the music at a later stage. Once students are comfortable with the movement, then you put it together with a second movement and you build movements on top of each other. But you can see from my description, this is quite different from a context where everyone is dancing, music is playing, and you are just trying to follow along and everything is uh, much more holistic and not broken down into what we see in the West, in, well, in the West, um, what is considered in Western uh, traditional dance pedagogy components of the dance, individual movements. Um, instruction in our uh, pedagogical style is usually accompanied by verbal descriptions of the movements. It's uh, from the straightforward, like lift your hip, to the anatomical, engage your oblique muscles, to the metaphorical, imagine your hip being pulled upward by a string. So we have this combination of dissecting the dance into an assortment of constitutive motions and the extensive use of spoken instruction. These two things together encourage the development of movement names here in a way that was not native to the cultures of origins of the dance. So why do the words we use to talk about Middle Eastern dance matter? Um, because the way we talk about something influences the way we think about it, at least to some extent. The extent to which it does is debated, but at least to some extent, it does influence our ideas about what we're talking about. Because Middle Eastern and belly dance movements have been named mostly using English words, meanings have been imported that affect our understanding of individual movements in particular and of the dance in general. So I just want to talk through an example of this by showing you a video. I'm going to just share my screen with you now. And we will move to a video here. Just have a look at this movement. Let's say we're naming it. We invent a brand new name for it. Let's call it a mulyab. So mulyab now has only one meaning in English, this movement that you're looking at. There's some semantic significance that we're importing even in the phonemes that we choose, even in the sound of the words, but by and large, we've imported relatively little outside meaning with this name choice. What if instead we called it rippling arms or arm undulations? These names in fact have been applied to this movement. Now we're in the realm of literal description. We're talking about a body part and the shape of its motion path. This draws attention to the corporeality of the movement, its embodiedness, it segments the, bodies, the body into parts, but it does not import a whole lot of other meaning. What if finally we called this movement snake arms? That in fact is the most popular name for it. Now we're importing a whole different set of connotations. We're comparing the movement of the body to the movement of an animal. Visualizations like this can make movements easier to learn, but on the other hand, they're criticized by some for being infantilizing, for sort of oversimplifying the dance in some ways. Um, and also this, this particular choice of image uh, has a certain Orientalism to it. Orientalism is a stereotyped view of um, Asia and the Middle East. And serpents, snakes, are freighted with Orientalist baggage. So they're prominent in European American fantasy images of the Middle East and East Asia. Think of snake charmers or Cleopatra and the asp, vipers in the desert. Um, serpents have all of this uh, kind of, uh, all of this connotative weight that they bring with them when we use them to refer to a movement of a dance that also originates in the Middle East. Um, quite a few movement names like snake arms have these types of Orientalist connotations. Now I want to when we talk about these three potential names for this dance movement, uh, I think we're making a distinction between naming something and naming a movement 
after something. So naming a movement, no matter what we call it, always means divorcing it from its original context, from its music, from other movements that are happening simultaneously and putting boundaries around it. So I'm going to play you a second video of uh, this movement. When this movement that we call snake arms is performed in Egyptian dance, it very rarely occurs by itself. It usually accompanies another movement like a movement of the hips that you can see in this video. So by calling it snake arms and teaching it independently, we're kind of divorcing it from the larger context in which it occurs and treating it like a, a unit that can easily be separated from everything else around it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Welcome back. Uh, so that naming is always going to, naming is always going to separate the movements out from each other and draw attention to them in this way. But naming a movement after something, naming it after an object or an animal or other image means we're laying a variety of other significance over the movement. We're suggesting maybe an attitude with which to execute the movement. We're, are, we're adding a lot that um, didn't exist in terms of meaning, significance, and symbolism in its original um, cultural context. So what types of names are used for Middle Eastern dance movements? I'm just going to show you an image right now that lists them so you can have a look at this. Uh, the name categories that I've identified, so these are, are my uh, invention for the purposes of analysis and not something that uh, sort of exists in the wild, uh, is body motion terms that identify the moving body part and the shape of its motion path, like head slide, chest circle, upward figure eight, borrowing from other dance styles, like Omi from Polynesian dance, barrel turn from jazz, uh, terms from Middle Eastern languages, like Toxin, terms from named after a Middle Eastern folk or ethnic dance style, like uh, Gawadzi Shimmy and Saidi Step, place names like Cairo Shimmy and Turkish Drop, personal names, names that are based on um, the names of an individual dancer, like the Soherzaki hip drop or the Maya, and imagery, terms that feature images like snake arms. Uh, there are terms that feature animals. Some feature names that describe the environment, like half moon walk or wind hands. Some are mechanical, like clockwork arms, piston shimmy. Uh, and I'm very interested in names that invoke different senses. So there are kinesthetic names like earthquake or flutter, which really uh, describe movement in a very obvious way. Some are visceral, like the lung expander or full belly, which use sensations from the interior of your body to describe a movement. And then there are auditory terms like dum tak and choo choo. I'm particularly keen on audio synesthetic movement terminology, which is why I've broken that out for you here. These are names that use non-musical sounds to suggest the desired movement. Uh, and one of these that's quite common in the United Kingdom and is also used to a lesser extent in Canada is chonks. I'll just give you a little demonstration of what this movement looks like so that you can get a sense of what I mean when I say audio synesthetic movement terminology. So this movement is chonks. They're very heavy drops on a weighted hip as you, uh, sorry, on a weighted leg, as you change your weight from one leg to the other, you're dropping the hip on that weighted leg. What I find so interesting about a name like Chonks is it's referring to, it's auditorizing the look or the feeling of doing the movement. It's transferring a sort of kinesthetic sensation to an auditory sensation. Since English has very few uh, words to describe sinus, um, sorry, to describe kinesthetic sensations, sensations of the body's movement, we substitute uh, words from another sense, like words from our auditory sense. 
And uh, we do this in lots of different ways. We're capable of this cognitively in lots of different ways. I'll just give you a little example of that. Think of the adjective bright. So we can have a bright color. If I say bright color, you might think of something like yellow. We can have a bright taste. Citrus might be described as a bright taste. We can have a bright sound, the tinkling of bells. So if we had to match a sound, to the taste of an orange, we're more likely to choose tinkling bells than the honk of a tuba because we have uh, the ability to kind of make comparisons between different sensory experiences across different sense modalities. So when we're using a word like chonks, that's an invented word, but when you imagine a movement that would capture the sound that you're hearing, um, it suggests something like a heavy, chunky, weighted hip drop. So this, I think, is a very uh, intriguing category of belly dance movement terminology, even if it's a relatively small one still at this stage. There's a lot of potential there using our own um, kind of innate cognitive ability for weak synesthesia, which is making comparisons across different sensory modalities. So to end the talk, I just wanna talk about a couple of different interesting movement names and the history behind them. So the caveat I'll give is that I'm relying largely on print sources, which can tell us the latest date by which a movement name is introduced, uh, but not the earliest one because some names might be in use orally sooner than they're ever like written down or printed in a book or what have you. But I'd like to look at some particularly well-known terms um, that have intriguing histories because they give us insight into, um, I think it's useful to have insight into the circumstances that led to these coinages that can help us understand their intended meanings and have a better understanding of their unintentional meanings, things that were brought in um, perhaps without the coin coiners' um, deliberate intention. So first, uh, I thought I would talk about the Maya. Now this one, uh, the story behind this name may already be familiar to some of you, but you might not know all the details. Uh, this is the subject of a common folk etymology. Now, what I mean by folk etymology is that is when people who are using a word uh, take a really good guess at where that word probably came from, but it's not necessarily correct. So the folk etymology for the Maya is that it comes from the Arabic word for water, ma'an, um, and people have written about that possibility online. In fact, the related Hebrew word Mayim for water is the name of a dance movement in Israeli folk dance. Maya, however, actually is a person's name. Uh, the name was coined by Jamila Salampour, a performer and instructor who's based in California. She appears to have been the very first how-to book author anyway to name movements after individual dancers. She met and watched other dancers while she was performing in the Arab nightclubs of Los Angeles and San Francisco in the 50s and 60s. And when she started to teach, she named some of the movements after the dancers she had seen performing them. So one of these was the Maya. I'll just show you what it looks like for people who um, are not belly dancers themselves so you can get a little sense of it. The Maya is this movement. It is a downward vertical hip figure eight, and it's often described as performed as though the dancer is stuck between two walls, so the dance movement does not tilt um, forward or back to either side. This movement was named for a dancer named Maya Medwar. Sorry, and I will just throw up a photo of her right here so you can have a look at her. This is a dancer of my, uh, sorry, a photo of Maya from a performance that she did in Egypt, or sorry, in Paris in uh, the 1950s. Um, she was born in Syria and raised in Egypt where she studied dance under Ali Reda, the older brother Mahmoud Reda. 
And after a stint performing in France in the 50s, she moved to Los Angeles and became the featured performer at the first Arab nightclub on the West Coast, the Fez. She was known for her very sinuous movements. She not only danced, but also sang as part of her act. And Jamila described her as having an exquisite and stately appearance combined with snake-like unexpected movements, which to this day have never been equaled. So the name Maya for a movement, even though the originating dancer, the dancer who inspired that name is uh, no longer as well known to dancers today as um, other dancers in our history, uh, her name continues to have staying power. It's still one of the uh, most widely known and most widely used names um, that teachers and students uh, have in circulation today based on the research that I have done. Uh, but most dancers, of course, did not learn it directly from Jamila Salampur, the source, which is why the history behind the term has for many people been lost. I also want to talk about the history of the term, the shimmy. So the shimmy is interesting to me because it's become practically synonymous with belly dance. It's a fundamental movement of practically every belly dance style out there. Um, and there are all sorts of different variants on it. I'll just share my screen, show you a couple of those. Pardon me while I move from one screen to the next. So you can have a shoulder shimmy, you can have hip shimmies, you can have shimmies layered with other movements. You can also have traveling shimmies, which you'll see in this video in a moment. It's any rapid, repetitive, evenly paced movement of the body, very, very common in our belly dance styles. Uh, the shimmy though, was not invented for belly dance. It did not uh, originate in the Middle East. Uh, it actually predates belly dance by, a, or sorry, predates uh, the invention of belly dance movement names in the 1960s by a substantial uh, margin. It was actually the name of a ragtime dance craze. Like many popular American dances, uh, the shimmy originated in the African American community and by the first decade of the 20th century, African Americans um, were using these relaxed, shaking movements of the shoulders and hips in their dancing. Um, sorry, I'll just move through here. Particularly in the Southern US, as African Americans moved from the Southern United States to the North, they started to mingle with white people at mixed race cabarets. And that's how white Americans started to pick up the shimmy or the shimmy shake as well. There were a lot of popular songs with shimmy in the name like Shimmy Shawabble, which was published in 1917. I Wish I Could Shimmy Like My Sister Kate, published in 1919. Well, sorry, if I said 2017, I meant 1917. Um, and various vaudeville, vaudeville performers like Mae West, B. Palmer, and Gilda Gray spread the craze to white people across the United States with their performances. Um, the next word I would like to talk about before we move to our question period is camel walk. Now this I will show you show you uh, what I'm referring to here if you are not a belly dancer. The camel walk can refer to a traveling full body downward undulation like this one. It can refer to an undulation of the pelvis like this one. It also often features level changes. So from the flat of the foot to the balls of the feet like this. Camel walk is uh, published in the very first belly dance how-to books in 1972. And what's intriguing about it is camel walk for a traveling undulation appears much earlier than camel for a stationary undulation, which some is a name that some dancers use today. Um, camel walk appears in six different how-to books, four of them published in the 1970s. So it was being very, very widely used for a traveling undulation from the very beginning. And it's not based on calling the undulation itself camel and then camel walk being that movement traveling because we don't get 
the word camel for uh, stationary undulation early on at all. It doesn't crop up until much later. So one wonders why this occurs. The folk etymology for camel is that the rocking motion looks like the movement of a camel strolling. But I suspect the camel walk may actually have also, like the shimmy, been inspired by a pre-existing African-American dance. So the camel walk dance was a ragtime vaudeville dance, later became a social couples dance, and then a solo dance. And it's one of a group of early 20th century dance crazes named after animals, like the turkey trot, the grizzly bear, the monkey glide. Uh, the chicken scratch. So it was quite common in the early 20th century to name dances after animals in this way. Um, the camel walk, the ragtime dance, has some interesting similarities to the camel walk in belly dance. I'm going to show you a video of, um, sorry, Sammy Davis doing the camel walk. Let me share my screen. Okay, so this video is available on YouTube if you would like to look it up yourself. This is um, Sammy Davis Jr. doing the camel walk. And what you'll notice about this, even though there is no pronounced undulation, I'm going to play a second video for you while I continue to speak. Even though there is no pronounced undulation in this version of the camel walk, and this is quite recent, camel walk in the Shrine Club um, in 2010, I believe, you'll notice that it has some similarities to what we call a camel walk in belly dance. That one foot is the lead foot that you're rocking your weight back and forth between your front foot and your back foot as you're traveling forward, that it has a bit of a lean to it as you make that weight change. So even though it's not identical, there are some intriguing and suggestive similarities between the two things. So I'm going to come back to you now if I can manage it. So this is pure speculation on my part because this um, naming history has not been recorded for our benefit. But I wonder if the name Camel Walk for the belly dance movement was inspired for the Camel Walk dance craze, which as you saw, still being done in the 1960s. That was Sammy Davis Jr. performing it on TV in the 1960s. And if the similarities between those traveling motions um, suggested that, that it might be a useful, applicable name to the movement that we're using, just like Shimmy, uh, which was a ragtime dance craze, was a useful name to import into belly dance. Uh, so these are just some examples of some of the histories I've been looking at of movement terminology. I'd like now to see if any of you have questions about uh, what I've been talking about so far. And if so, I'll take the next 10 minutes or so to answer those before we conclude our event this evening. So just give me one minute, because I have seen a couple of things pop up in the chat. What is the most unusual term I've come across as a movement description? Ooh, that is tough, because um, some come to mind, like the Arabic coffee grinder, I find really uh, is an interesting one, because it is... Uh, it is, it is very visual, but it's not, it is not necessarily highly appealing. There are some that are, are, were coined and are only in use in small areas like the Frankenstein walk and um, trying to think, uh, Matante Yvonne arms were something that someone submitted in my survey that I thought was really interesting. But I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of unique and unusual names. Um, I'm looking at, at my list here, uh, Crucifix Arms is an offbeat one. Um, but there, it, there are really a broad variety of unusual names, especially in the how-to books uh, from the 1970s that I could provide you with a whole list of um, surprising <laughs> and strange names from those sources because people were just coming up with whatever made sense to them and whatever worked for their students. Sometimes um, teachers 
enjoy terms that are a little bit entertaining. It's memorable. It helps students remember what you're talking about. So definitely you can see humor in some of the terms that teachers uh, came up with to describe movements to their students. And as a result, there is a wide variety. Uh, there are a wide variety of naming strategies that have been in use um, in the belly dance community from the earliest period of naming. Um, okay, another question. Uh, do you think belly dance movement nomenclature should be standardized? This is an interesting question and it's one I've had um, a few different times. In fact, in some of the research that I've been doing, I've had people, I think, uh, assume that my project is to uh, create a standardized movement terminology that then all belly dancers can look to uh, as the as the version that we're all using that is consistent. Uh, that isn't my project. I have a more descriptive uh, project. I'm interested in looking at the history and what people are doing and theorizing and explaining it. So I'm, I'm kind of coming at it from a more academic angle. Uh, in terms of my personal opinion, I would say that when I was younger, um, in my earlier stage of my dance uh, career, I definitely thought that movement terms should be standardized because it would facilitate communication between teachers and students. It would facilitate um, choreography transmission, make it easier to learn things, to notate things, to communicate them from one dancer to another. Um, so it, it has a useful communicative element, a useful mnemonic element. If you jot something down and there's a standardized movement terminology, you'll always know what you were referring to. So there are benefits in that sense. But as I've given it more thought uh, researching this area, I now am not in favor of a standardized movement terminology. And the reason for that is that although I personally, as a dancer and a learner, am very comfortable with Western studio pedagogy, where you go in, you break the movements down, and you teach them bit by bit, and then build them into a dance form. I think this method of learning uh, and transmitting movement is related to changes in the dance, or, or I don't want to say has caused, but has accompanied is related to changes in the dance that have occurred in Western countries that have taken it away in some ways from uh, Middle Eastern North African practice. So for instance, there's less improvisation, uh, which I think uh, is partly because people don't learn the movements in context with the music. You really learn the movements in little um, parcels and little they're little tiny components and you might practice them a million times to a song before moving on to your next one, instead of seeing how the dance looks with the movement from the very beginning. So dancers are often less comfortable uh, improvising to music. I also think that breaking the movements down into, or sort of breaking the dance down into its constitutive movements, naming them, taxonomizing them in this way, uh, it kind of emphasizes movement technique and athleticism over all the other parts of the dance. So the most important thing becomes, well, you know, do you know how to do a, a layered piston shimmy over a hip circle? Do you know how to do a, a barrel turn with uh, wings? Um, do you know how to do this technique or that technique? instead of focusing on musicality and expressivity and em the emotional content of the dance, which are definitely more sought after in performers in a home country like Egypt, where emotional expression is very, very highly sought after and highly rated in professional dancers. So I think our movement terminology may not be the cause of those changes, but there is definitely a relationship that we can see between the way we tend to break dance down into pieces and what the dance looks like when we build it back up into a whole at the end of the day that makes um, our dancing in North America and Europe and other countries that learn the dance in this way look different. Um, from, it's always going to look different anyway, but look substantially different, feel substantially different uh, from the way the dance is practiced in its home country. So 
at this stage of my dance journey, I am very interested in the possibilities of how you could teach in North America in a way that is more reminiscent of participatory transmission, mimetic learning that you get in the Middle East when, when a child is learning the dance. Like, could you replicate that in the West? Instead of learning movement names, could you people, could you, you have a format where people are following along, where people are learning the movements in context, where you're still offering feedback and correction, but it's more holistic. Those are the types of ideas that are intriguing me right now. So I wouldn't necessarily advocate in favor of standardized nomenclature for that reason. Maybe we should move away somewhat from nomenclature. That's my kind of thought process right now. So if anyone else has questions, please feel free to pop them into the live chat. Okay, here's another one I can just answer briefly before we um, clue up. Uh, the or what are the origins of the name snake arms? Um, I did not go into that because the origins are not as um, clear or perhaps um, revelatory as a couple of the other ones that I talked about. But there are actually over 10 movement names with the word snake, serpent, cobra, what have you, in the 1970s belly dance how-to books. Um, snake arms is one of the only ones that survived, to, that appears to have survived at least in wide popularity to this day. Um, and th these snake related terms appear to have been quite popular, probably for a couple of different reasons, probably because um, the image of a snake evokes a certain sinuous quality of movement that is desirable uh, for certain uh, aspects of belly dance, um, but also because it evokes to some extent images of this fantasy orient, like I was speaking about earlier, you know, snakes, Snakes have um, sort of a lot of cultural cachet. So I'm, I'm thinking that that is definitely part of why snake names were so popular um, at that early period. So even though I, I can't tell you exactly how snake arms was coined and where it comes from, I can tell you that snake names in general were very popular from the very beginning, probably for these two reasons, because the movement quality they suggest and because um, they have these unfortunate Orientalist fantasy connotations. So now it is almost eight o'clock, and I would like to clue up by thanking ArtsNL for supporting this talk through the Art in the Time of COVID Fund. I really appreciate all the work that ArtsNL has been doing to support artists during this um, challenging time. Uh, I'd also like to thank Charlene Jackson for doing all the behind the scenes work on this event. Uh, and she is the one who is helping to make this streaming session on uh, YouTube possible right now. I really appreciate all the work that she's been doing. For more information on the research that I do or to get in touch with me, please visit my website. It's ainsleyhawthorne.com, A-I-N-S-L-E-Y-H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N.com. You can find links to the other research papers I've written and info about talks that I've given. You can even watch some other talks uh, that I have linked to over there. Thank you everyone who tuned in live for this event and good night. <laughs>